Hello? And there he is, Mr. Joey Danger. Hey, how's it going, man? Good, man. How you doing? I'm very good. Dude, like, okay. So, uh, <laughs> when a per- when I say, like, a person's talented, it- it's like, okay, you're talented. But you're, like, beyond talented. You're, like, fucking, yeah. like, like I- I'm, like, blown away. Like, you got, like, skills in, like, every area. <laughs> like, how-, how does this happen? I mean, dude, like, seriously. Like, the video skills, the music skills, I mean, come on. It's all over the place. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. I mean, I guess it comes out of a need, you know. I mean, I, I didn't grow up. I grew up in a, you know, a fairly small town. I didn't have a lot of resources or, you know, any money. And so if I wanted things done the way I had it in my head, I just kind of had to figure out how to do it on my own. And, and so it started from a need, and then it became a passion once I, once I started doing it. Yeah, I, I mean, and you got a hell of a story too. Like, I, like let's go back to the beginning. Like, um, mm-hmm. I mean, you had a rocky road of life. Um, you yeah, started, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like your your passion for music, and it sounds like your true first love was music, and you started young, uh, doing your own songs through a karaoke machine. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that was that was definitely um, how it, how it originally started. I, I remember I I started doing multi track recording when I was really young. Um, with what I would do is I would record myself playing like the drums on a tape and then I'd put it in the karaoke machine and then I'd play like the bass along with it. And then I'd, you know, switch to guitar. And so I started, I started multi-track recording with the karaoke machine and then eventually you moved up to a four track tape recorder and then a digital eight track and then the computers. So, I mean, the, the love and interest for music production was always there along, you know, it was kind of like being a musician and a songwriter, what the, like my interest and my love for that uh, uh, grew with my my also my interest and love for recording and production, so it, they were both kind of happened at the same time. But also during that time, I was obsessed with my mom's video camera. I would you know make all these like little home movies and sci-fi movies and horror movies with kids in the neighborhood, and um, and so I, I and I had been doing that since a really young age too. So it seemed to me like totally natural, like to just, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people are like, that's crazy that you do music and you do film and, and visual effects and stuff, but uh, in production, but I'm like, honestly, to me, they, I mean, they, they were all part of the same thing, you know, like they were all part of the same, like creative force. Like I would get an idea and I would be imagining what the music would sound like, but if you want the music to sound right, you have to produce it. And I would imagine what I had, you know, what the visuals could be, but if you want the visuals done, you have to film it. So to me, like, it, like, I didn't really feel like I was doing anything that on like that bizarre. I was just kind of being creative, but I really appreciate that people find that, um, that people like that and that people, you know, really value that about me. It makes me feel great. Like, well, let me explain the difference here, especially like for, for me in my world, like, you know, I, I grew up, um, kid in the seventies and a teenager in the eighties. So, uh, my whole big passion, you know, initially with music was, uh, was kiss of the seventies and then the whole big, yeah. you know, hair band explosion of the eighties. So I was like the whole rock and metal scene and uh, wanted to be a guitar player and play in a band and be the quote unquote rock star. But that's where, like, as I've gotten older now, I realized like that was my whole big problem was I was more worried about wanting to be the rock star than the musician. And it's like you like took that from the early age of not only wanting to be the musician, but learn the ins and outs of all the different aspects of music with the recording and stuff like that, where I was just like, I, I could care less. I just want to do this and just be in the magazine. That, you know what I mean? Like be on MTV and be I in magazines. That was my main concern where, I mean, no, you totally, no, I uh, totally, I, I, yeah, I totally get that. I mean, look, part of it might've been insecurity, you know, because I don't think I ever deep down felt like I was cool enough to just like, how do I explain it? Like, I don't know that I think deep down I always felt like I had something to prove, right? Like like I didn't think sure. anybody was going to find me and just go, "You know what? You're the guy I should put in on in front of a camera or you know what? You're the guy who needs to go into a recording studio." And I think because I'm, you know, always been so hard on myself and I've always been very critical of myself, I think it was easier for me to want to be the person behind the scenes uh, you know, recording my music or making sure that I sound as good as I can or making sure my visuals look as good as they can as opposed to, you know, relying on somebody else because I didn't know if it would come out as good or if, if it, you know, or if I would, it, it definitely stemmed from like a, 
from a, like a being a bit of a perfectionist and probably a bit insecure. <laughs> right, right. But now um, you dropped out of high school, which I did as well. <laughs> um, and you right ran on. away from home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you ran away at home from sixteen, like to, to pursue yeah. pursue your uh, your love of music. So, like, where do you go? Like, you know, that was my first question. Like, oh, I'm thinking yeah. at sixteen, like. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm sure every kid thinks of that, but it's like I was like, where the hell do I end up going? Yeah, I, well, I mean, so I grew up Jehovah's Witness, which was a pretty strict lifestyle. Um, we didn't, you know, I mean, if anybody knows anything about Jehovah's Witnesses, you don't really have any holidays. Um, everything is pretty much evil or satanic. Um, so, being a fan of like Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie and stuff like that as a young kid definitely didn't go over very well especially when I'm like wearing all black and like doing the whole like rock star thing at like 11 years old, <laughs> like, you know, from 11 anyway, I should say. So by the time I was about 15 or 16, um, I just, you know, I, I knew, I mean, by the time I was 11 or 12, I knew I wanted to be a musician and I knew I wanted to make like videos and stuff. Um, and so for me, like anything that wasn't going to teach me how to be a producer or how to be a better musician or how to be a filmmaker just wasn't interesting to me. So like, even though like, you know, everybody was going to high school, they were like, Oh, well, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I was like, I want to be a rock star. Like I want to be a, a filmmaker. Like if you know, all this time I'm spending in school right now in high school, I could just spend, you know, learning how to use my recording gear, or learning how to play, you know, guitar better or playing shows. So, like, I just kind of had this moment, you know, my parents were in the middle of going through a divorce at that time, so they were kind of preoccupied, and I just was like, you know what, I'm out of here. So I left, I stayed with different bandmates of mine, um, I would kind of bounce around from couch to couch, but what it allowed me by dropping out of high school, not that I'm condoning this, and I think everyone should do it, but uh, what it allowed me was, I spent, you know, pretty much from 16 onward, like, just spending all my time while everyone else was in school or in college. Um, learn, you know, just doing what I'm learning about the things I wanted to learn about and trying to hone my craft and playing show, you know, playing shows in random bands and, and learning about recording and, and learning about filmmaking. And so, yeah, that was, that was kind of like my, my training time. That's awesome. And I mean, now it was, I, I um... mean, don't, don't me, it was rough. <laughs> I had drug problems and everything else. You take a sheltered kid who's a Jehovah's witness and you throw him into the real world. And of course there's going to be some, some craziness, but fortunately I got through that. Now, now was it part of, um, uh, were your parents like supportive of the music or just because it was, you know, of the religion, um, they were just against it. No, no. One thing I always say, I mean, and, and, you know, now, I mean, they, they're, they're very proud of me and supportive. Um, I mean, me and my dad don't really talk, but I know my, my mom's extremely supportive, but, and she always has been, they've always been supportive of my music. Uh, my dad used to play guitar for Arthur Conley back in the sixties and he was, he was a big musician. Um, well, I have a lot, you know, I have like entertain my, my grandfather was on like a soap opera and stuff uh, like, like that. I have, we have entertainers in our family. So, um, it, you know, it my like from a young age, like when I first started, my first kind of I guess creative outlet was drawing, and they nurtured that like crazy. And my mom always said, I don't care what grades you bring home. What's more important to me is the kind of person you are and what you what you're doing with your life. And so, um, no, I mean, I honestly know if it wasn't for for my mom and, and and you know actually both of my parents, you know, really supporting my dreams, I probably and nurturing that idea and giving me the tools to kind of explore those talents, I probably would have never even known I had this talent. So they you know they've always been, they've always been supportive. It, me leaving at 16 was just me being a 16 year old kid who was like, I don't want to go to high school. I don't want to follow my parents' rules. I don't want to have to, you know, I, I want to do like, I was just always rebellious. I always had a problem with authority. And so I didn't like being told what to do. And so that, that was the reason I left. It, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't because they didn't support my dream. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, uh, speaking of a uh, problem with authority and, uh, you know, troubled past, I mean, you had some issues, too, where you ended up going to jail, some drug issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of just a byproduct of being poor and homeless, honestly. I mean, when you're, you know, I, I grew up in a town that's kind of, it's, it's in Cocoa, uh, I was living in Cape Canaveral, I think during that time, Cape Canaveral, Florida, Cocoa Beach area. And pretty much okay. that's where all everybody from up north goes to <laughs> So it's to retire. There's not a lot of opportunity there. I feel like you either become you either become a person who works for 
practically minimum wage or a drug dealer or a stripper or something in between in that area if you're if you didn't already come down with money or have a job you know somewhere far away so you know it was funny because it was totally normal for me in the environment that I grew up in you know doing drugs and getting involved in crazy stuff and getting arrested and stuff like that. Like, you know, during that time in my life, that was what was ha- That's what all my friends were doing too. Like getting arrested wasn't right. a big deal, you know, doing a bunch of crazy drugs for, you know, days on end without sleep, you know, and, and breaking into houses. And so that was just totally normal. And so it didn't even dawn on me, you know, until I pulled myself out of that situation and kind of had to take a hard look in the mirror and ask myself who I wanted to be. It didn't even fully kind of, I don't think I really understood the gravity of just how kind of off the rails my life was. But once I finally did, I, I, you know, I I completely did a 180. Now, was that too, like, um, I I guess you coming to to reality with things of life and stuff like that, is that what caused you to to Mm. leave Florida and move to New York? Or was it more or less like, all right, like I got to get out of here and follow this uh, passion? I wish I would have, I I wish I would have left Florida and moved to New York right when I wish I would have had the ability to do that. I'd probably be light years further along in my career right now, but um, I just didn't have the means to do it. And, and I just don't, you know, maybe in a lot of ways I wasn't ready. I mean, for me, I was, you know, I had a really bad Coke problem and, and, and that was when I kind of got over that addiction and I had this, just kind of had this moment. I was at this kind of was like basically a crack house that I was uh, at, and I had this kind of moment where I was looking around and, and there was, you know, a lot of stuff I won't repeat going on, but I remember just thinking to myself, um, this isn't was this wasn't part of the plan. Like this wasn't part of my dream. Right. Like this isn't like, I, you know, we, ever since I was a little kid, I always had people telling me, Oh, you know, you can do something really great. Or, you know, you have these talents. Like I know you're going to do something great with them. So when you have in it's, and it's a great thing to have that, but when you have like you, this feeling like, you kind of have been told your your whole life like you're gonna do something great with yourself, and then you're sitting there staring at yourself, looking in the mirror, and your skin and bones, and and you look and feel like crap, and you know your life's going nowhere. For me, it was just like an it was just happened in an instant. Like I was just like, I'm done with this, um, and so I be immediately like, I mean, almost overnight, I, I I immediately was just like focused on how do I learn about music production, how do I how do I start working on my first, you know, real album? How do I get into music videos? And so I left that town and I moved to Orlando and so I could get away from everything and kind of start over. I originally wanted to go to college at Full Sail University. I got a GED so that I could go to Full Sail University, but unfortunately I wasn't able to afford it. So I became roommates with someone who did go to Full Sail University and kind of picked their brains and read their book on how to do uh, – you know, high level music production. And fortunately one of our, so I had two roommates. One of the roommates was going to school for music production. The other roommate was going to school at full sale for video production. So I, I, right around that time, I was just literally like asking them for any piece of advice or any knowledge that they had and like picking their brains constantly. They would let me borrow their book. And, um, and so that's when I made my first music, uh, I made my first single and my first music video at the same time, because I was getting to use, the gear that uh, fortunately my, my roommate Kyle, who was a music guy, had, because I, I was poor. I couldn't afford any real music gear. But he let me use his, his gear that he had. My video guy basically told me how to make uh, how to do visual effects and told me about After Effects and all this stuff. And I found, like, bootleg versions of After Effects online. And I shot the video with this really, really crappy picture camera that took, like, 15 seconds of video and the, like, monitor screen on it was broken. But, like, I, I, in the end, I ended up making this video with me like flying around and doing visual effects. I mean, I I, I cringe when I look at it now, but that video (laughs) kind of launched my career um, because so many people were like, you did this with what? Like, like, you know, and for the time YouTube was brand new. So to have the video with all these special effects and crazy things, it was, it was kind of like a big deal at the time. Holy cow. So now, now how how, how about, um, (laughs) <laughs> when did uh, the Rock and Roll McDonald's happen? Oh, wow. You know about Rock and Roll McDonald's. You did some research. <laughs> um, that's funny. Uh, so Rock and Roll McDonald's actually happened before the music video. That was um, that was when I was first learning about, like, um, I, that was, like, basically, so, so I had just moved to Orlando, and I had a bunch of friends, and we would basically sit around and get drunk, and because YouTube was brand new, I was just like, man, like, we need to make something that's just going to shock people. Like, you know, like, 
something that's just going to, it was literally me just trolling the internet, trying to think of like the just most gruesome, horrible things that we could put on YouTube. Um, and, and I've always been a big fan of nostalgia. Like, you know, I always, I always try to find ways to bring stuff from my childhood and, and stuff that I feel like all of us are nostalgic about into my art. Even in the new video surrender, I tried to do that at least tonally with the retro eighties vibe, but in my previous video stars, I had the DeLorean from Back to the Future and a lot of stuff like that. But so I was just like, I just want to take all my favorite childhood things, you know, whether it's, you know, Ronald McDonald and the Hamburglar and all things that we hold sacred, like Jesus and religion, just take all of it back to the future, take all of it and just completely, you know, uh, just just make it the most horrible, just, just, just flip it on its head and make it the most horrible, shocking thing I could do. And that was just comes from angst, you know, being young and wanting to shock people. Sure. <gasps> Uh, that's funny. So, so I mean, we had a lot of fun York, it, it, it looked – I was watching some of it earlier. I'm like, this is just off the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, you ended up uh, moving to New York in 2012. So, w- the one thing I was thinking, that why did you choose New York over L.A.? Um, well, there were a couple of reasons. One, I had lost my license. So it made more sense to be in New York because I couldn't drive anymore uh, because my license was suspended. That was big. That was a part of it. Um, And also I always have uh, always kind of been more interested in the city. Like I grew up, you know, wishing that I lived in Gotham city and, you know, watching movies and TV shows that took place in New York. And just that I, I always was, I always wanted that life. You know, my favorite movies like, you know, Blade Runner and stuff, like I would see these amazing cityscapes and I just always felt like I didn't feel like I belonged in Florida. You know, everyone around me was walking around in board shorts and a t-shirt and like I was always like dressed to the nine and all black. Like, why am I here in Florida sweating right now? So <laughs> I, I definitely, I, I definitely felt like that was where I met, it was meant to be. And when I, and when I went there, cause I went there to visit, uh, so that I could look for an apartment while I was visiting. And I mean, the moment that I got there, it was kind of like the only way I can describe it was be, it would be like a fish being in the right kind of water. Like, I mean, just everything started clicking for me. I got along with people easier. People took to me better opportunities just kept presenting themselves constantly. Um, girls liked me more. <laughs> I mean, like everything was better. It was like I got to New York and it was just like, Oh my God. So this is the life I could have been living like this whole time. So yeah, I mean, there was, if maybe if it hadn't gone that way, I would have decided to try out LA, but New York just seemed to make sense uh, at, at that time. That's funny. All, all from the license being suspended, things work out. <laughs> well, I mean that there it was, it was, it was two things or three things. It was the license being suspended. It was, the fact that I've always seen uh, LA as a place that you don't want to go there unless you've already, unless you're already somebody like, unless you've already established yourself because everybody sure. wants to be somebody. And I felt like it would be depressing to be surrounded by, you know, like to, to be in that kind of an environment if I didn't even have a leg to stand on. Whereas I felt like New York is a little bit different. Like it's kind of where you go to make it and people kind of respect your hustle and they respect your grind. And I feel like they're more willing to help you if they see you working hard because that's kind of just the mentality and the attitude of New York. Whereas LA, I feel like they're more likely to kind of be like, uh, see you as competition or, or I don't know. It's just, it's just a different vibe that I've gotten from LA. So so that was part of it. And another reason was I was in a band. I took a, a, like, after my second EP, Alive, music changed drastically. And and all of a sudden, Skrillex is, like, the biggest thing ever, and dubstep is this big thing. And so musically, I've always been somebody that I don't want – I don't like doing the same thing. I don't think any of my albums sound the same. And the reason is because I, my tastes change, and I change as a person. And if I don't feel like I have something I can add musically that's going to be, you know – modern or, or on the cutting edge of music, I just don't feel inspired to do it. I don't, I, I that's just the way that I, my brain works. I, and, and so I didn't know anything about dubstep. I, I it was this brand new thing and like rock. It, it was like, it was almost like when, when, to me, it was almost like when Nirvana came out and the grunge wave happened and it just killed the eighties hair band. I felt like when EDM and exploded and dubstep exploded, all of a sudden just rock and like that whole sound was just immediately dead. And so I was like, what am I going to do? And so uh, I partnered up. Uh, I was going through a lot of personal stuff in my personal life as well, like, like in a really, really dark place. But I, I had met um, this girl, Marissa, who, en- who ended up being, and still is one of my creative par- partners. And she, uh, she, was, 
she was all about, you know, this new sound. And so she kind of, I partnered with her and created this, uh, this like duo project with her. And she kind of helped me through that phase where I was kind of trying to rediscover my sound. So we did an album together and she played a big part in moving to New York as well. Cause she was really pushing me like, come on, let's move to New York. Let's do this. Like, screw it. Like who cares? Let's get out of Florida. So she was, you know, I think it was a combination of her, the license, and the fact that I was afraid if I went to L.A. without without any clout that it was just going to make me more depressed than I already was. <laughs> <laughs> and and plus, I, I think uh, it could be something, almost you summed it up, uh, you said the line, but I think Frank Sinatra summed it up with uh, New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. You know, I believe that now, having lived there for, you know, six or seven years, I can tell you, um, or I guess it's been six years, I can tell you, though, um, it, it was the hardest thing I ever did. The first year that I lived there, I think I, 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 I thought about leaving like every week. I mean, it was like it, coming from Florida and living, I mean, and I've lived, oh, I've lived rough, but it was never challenging. Like all the, all the ways that I lived rough was kind of my own fault or, or, you know, just financial or circumstantial. This was just a very, it was just a tough life. But once I, you know, the people just dealing with those kinds of people, one thing that helped me was a book called The 48 Laws of Power, and that kind of became my Bible. And I, uh, I started reading that a lot, and it started helping me kind of navigate, like, all the kind of snakes that you would run into and sociopaths that you deal with on a daily basis. And, and it, you know, it, New York ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me, though, because it, it really helped me grow as a person, as an artist. It helped me definitely grow creatively. I mean, having, having all those – having just – all this amazing inspiration around you all the time and feeling like you're right there on the brink, on the cutting edge of like music and fashion. Um, it's just super inspiring. And I don't think I really realized how far ahead we were until the Harlem shake thing happened. And I was like, I've known, I knew that about a year ago. <laughs> I knew about that a year ago. And now a year later, it's like, you know, become this like meme and a phenomenon. And I was like, wow. So it's almost like I've got this great advantage that, I know it's going to be cool bef- way before it's actually cool. So if I start working on something now, by the time I'm finished with a project, everybody else will have caught up to it and I'll be like right on the way. So there was all these great things about New York that really inspired me. Yeah. I was kind of wondering too, cause I, I you know, I went back and I was listening to some of your, your uh, earlier music and I was thinking like, you know, it, it's a drastic change. I'm thinking, how, how did he go from the, the whole rock to like the, the EDM world? And I, you know what I mean? So I, I mean, mm. I, I, I get it. I, I totally get it. Like, you know, and it's funny because, you know, you hear older stories of, uh, you know, I, I, like older bands from like 70s and 80s. And they used to hear that, you know, back in the days where you, you needed the record company, where the record companies were like, oh, you're too late. Like, we want a sound that's different. You were coming out with a sound that was a hit like, you know, six months ago. And, and right. yeah, I mean, exactly. No, and what I mean, you know, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, this album, Lux and Vulgarity, I still, you know, I'm still very proud of it. But it's too, it, it was finished two years ago. Um, I, it just got stuck in limbo with record labels. But I think it would have been even more relevant if it had come out when I finished it. But yeah, I, 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 I'm one of those people that I have that really kind of. It's funny because I personally hate it when my favorite artists change their sounds, <laughs> like. I'm like, that's not what I love about you. You changed what I love about you. So it's just, it's it's so like, it's, it makes me such a hypocrite to be, to be an artist. But I mean, all I can be is true to myself. And, 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 and I can say like, I just, I don't like to do the same thing because I only want to do something while I feel like it, it's, it's relevant to, to now. I, you know, I always want to live in the now creatively and, you know, I think artists that have done a great job of that, like if you look at somebody like Madonna's early career, she kept reinventing herself over and over. But every time she did it, um, you know, she she was good. Somehow she didn't stick to the same thing. And even though I'm not a huge Madonna fan, that was something about her that I always admired. And I always thought if I'm an artist, I would want to be like that and never, never stay, never stay in one realm. Always, you know, if, if things change and, and trends change and music changes, like don't, don't stay stuck in your old ways, like grow and be like water and kind of flow with, with things as they change. And, you know, and that's, and that's the kind of artist I always like to be when it comes to anything, when it comes to my, my visual art or my, my sonic art. Yeah. You know, you know, it's funny too, cause I'm kind of the same way where, you know, uh, being a fan of an artist and they, they do that change, you know, on some do each album and some don't, you're kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I, I hate when they change, but 
you know, again, as I've gotten older, I'm not even going to say as the artist in me, but as I've gotten older and more mature, like, I get it now. Like, and looking at it from that standpoint of the artist, it's like, yeah, like, it, 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 I think it, it expresses and shows how much talent, you know, a person like yourself or whoever actually has to be able to change and, and not be stuck in that one, you know, genre of music. Well, and your tastes change. Your influences change. You know, the people, right. the bands that I was listening to and the music I was listening to when I did my first EP couldn't be more different than the music that I was listening to when I made this, this EP. You know, I mean, and, and each, each, you know, each time I had different influences, I was in a different headspace. I was a different person mentally and emotionally. Um, you know, so, so you couldn't, I could never write a song any of the songs from my old EP, because I'm definitely not that person anymore. Like lyrically, co- contextually, I couldn't write that kind of a song uh, any uh, ever again. So, you know, I think that if I were to do that just for the sake of making somebody else happy, it wouldn't be being true to myself. It wouldn't be honest, and it probably wouldn't be any good. Right. For the uh, for the new EP, Lust and Vulgarity, you have the the new video which came out for the single Surrender. Um, Yep. Which is amazing. I mean, <laughs> it's funny because uh, your PR person, she, she sent me over. She's like, uh, she sent me your name and somebody else's, and I instantly went with the second name. And she's like, well, what about uh, Joey? And I'm like, I thought they were both from the same band, the way it was worded. I'm like, oh. So I went back and I looked and I watched the video and I was like, she's like, let me guess, you're not into that? I'm like, nope, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, just from watching the video. I was like, holy <laughs> crap, man. Like, so like, and Thanks, that's right. See, I thought, I thought like, because when I saw it was done, you know, two years ago, the music. I'm like, oh, and then I saw you took 16 months to make the video. I'm like, wow, what, was it he having to sit on it for all that time just to make the video to release the music or? No, well, the reason the music got stuck for two years was um, was because of the record labels. So I got approached uh, exactly, almost exactly two years ago. I I did a soft release of the EP. Um, and I got approached, like, I want to say my current agent, he's funny, he's my agent now, but he at the time was an A&R rep for Universal. Um, he approached me, saw my Stars music video uh, the, for the, um, the first uh, video I did for the album. And he called me up and he was like, I love your video. I just heard your, I just heard your EP. I love the EP. Um, you need to take it down, though, so we can shop it. Don't, you know, don't, don't have this up on iTunes or Spotify. We need to shop this to the labels. And I was like, okay, and he's, or, or at the time, Universal. Um, so he's like, we need, to, you know, I can get you a deal with Universal. The problem was, is the deal wasn't good. Everything, it, it would have been, it just, it wouldn't have worked. And there's a very good chance I probably wish, would have just gotten shelved because I just didn't have a big enough following. And so right. we spent, at that point, Rick believed in me so much. I mean, he really, really believed in me. And he was like, look, um, you know, just because Universal doesn't want to give you a good record deal doesn't mean that we can't, you know, we can't g- find you something else. And so he actually, you know, left Universal and was just fighting for me. I mean, like, you know, I- I'm so grateful to have someone like him in my corner because he just really believes in, in me and-, and believes in what he feels, is, you know, I'm capable of doing, you know, in the future. And so he was, he fought for me for two years and we start, and then we ended up starting a record label, but in the end, it just, it all kind of, all those things kind of dissolved. And while that was going on, that like, it, it was just kind of so discouraging for me. Um, and so my way of coping with it was focusing all my energy into surrender and being like, well, look, I feel like, I feel like I'm just taking hit after hit and loss after loss. And the only way that I can like, the only way that I can make myself feel better right now and not kind of just give up is to try to do something that will hopefully be a huge win for me. Something that like, you know, I can't control what these people think about me. I can't control what these labels try to choose to do. I can't control anything else, but what I can control is if I can make something that's hopefully so fucking cool or pardon my French, sorry, (laughs) make something that's so cool that, that, uh, that people, that people will take in notice and that maybe these labels will stupid for not believing in me. And so that was, that was, that was kind of where my mind was. And, you know, I got approached by – it couldn't have come at a better time because right while all that was going on, I, I, I got approached by this photographer named Morgan Miller. And this is how, this is how the video came to be. Um, I, was, I was already wanting to do a video for Surrender because that was the one the labels kept telling me they thought was going to be a single. And so 
I uh, I knew that I wanted I, I wanted to do a video for that, and I was in the works with that. And then I got a call from um, from Morgan Miller, and he said, "Well, hey, um, I'm doing a project with this magazine, IRK Magazine, and I had worked with them in the past." And um, he said, "You know, we they have this futurism issue that they're doing, and they kind of have this Blade Runner esque theme. And I know you love that style. Would you be interested in maybe potentially helping us with the video shoot or even doing a fashion film?" And I was like, I thought about it, and there was no budget or anything. I wasn't getting paid for it. But I said, look, I will do this, and I will make sure that it's the coolest, you know, craziest thing that I can make if I can also have it be my music video. And so they talked about it, and they said, yeah, go for it. We love the idea. Let's do it. So I, I, that's what I did. We shot for three days in front of a green screen. Um, and basically the way that it worked was I had to kind of come up with a story on the fly because everyone was doing this shoot, you know, pretty much for free. And so – the stylists and, and the wardrobe, they, their ideas of what they wanted to do didn't even match up with the, the uh, storyboard that I showed up with for what I wanted to film. So, like, on the fly, I'm rewriting my storyboard, like, literally seconds before I shoot, trying to figure out, like, how to make this story work now with, you know, the choices, the creative choices that the team was making. And their choices were amazing. It's just I had no idea what they were going to do on the day of shooting. So it definitely I had to think on my feet. But in the end, I still I still feel like I was able to tell the the gist of the story the way that I imagined it. And, and I think that visually it came out amazing. So, um, but it, you know, it was it was one of those things. But, yeah, it was it was a hard process finishing it um, because it, it did take me all together. The version that you saw was 16 months worth of visual effects, and and that was and that, those were long days. Holy cow! <laughs> yeah, yeah. What would, that, that's what, what happens. That when, said. That's what happens when you are, like or are, are have a, a problem with being overly obsessed about your work. That's the type of crazy. <laughs> I don't think anybody else would be loony enough to do what I did, and even I knew halfway through how insane it was. But at that point, I had already gone. I was already halfway through and I was like I, I gotta finish this now well, well have people said that to you I mean have people said like dude like that's so freaking over the top and I mean it's nobody would expect you know what I mean like people would expect that from you know who, who's the big name out there like a tower swift you know what I mean like somebody like huge like that yeah you know, Cardi B or somebody well, I, mean, I the big think names that's why I now. wanted to I think that's I mean that's why I want to do it though like I mean uh, when when those I don't like, I, all right, I'm in the process of potentially making a film right now, and I was talking to the producer uh, that we were going to do the film with, and he was saying, this film that you want to do is so ambitious, and it's so, like, over the top. Like, it's something that, like, a major movie studio would put out, and you want to do it on, like, a, you know, half a million dollar budget. And I was like, if the thing is, is for me, he's like, why don't you start off with something simple, like a very, like a small horror movie or something simple. And the answer to that, and, and this is kind of what comes back to everything creatively with me. If I don't feel like what I'm making is going to make people go, whoa, if I don't feel like what I'm doing is like the coolest thing that I personally think it, like if, if, if it's not something that I would personally go, man, that is badass. That is the coolest thing ever. Then it doesn't inspire me. I don't feel passionate about it. And I'm not interested in it. Like I don't, I don't feel passionate sure. about small indie horror movies. So why would I want to make one? You know, like I don't feel right. passionate. About, I don't get excited about a music video where it's just a band standing in a warehouse with a bunch of shaky footage. Like that's not, that doesn't interest me. Like so for me, if if uh, like when I imagine the things that get me excited and inspire me, it's always you know these big grandiose things. So I think for me it was like, well, I got. I don't think it's fair that Taylor Swift gets to have those videos. You know, like. The only reason Taylor Swift gets to have those videos is because Taylor Swift makes a lot of money. But like, you know, right. that that doesn't mean that I, you know, I want to have a video like that. So it's kind of like that, like that little br- like bratty kid in you that's like, I want a cool music video. <laughs> you know, like I'm gonna do whatever <laughs> it takes to have one. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, and and just you know, passion, the passion of it, the art form, the ability to express yourself on on a grand scale. I mean. You know, I've loved cyberpunk since I was a little kid. That's what inspired me to make movies in the first place. It, I mean, Go- Akira, Ghost in the Shell, um, Blade Runner is my ultimate. I mean, so the chance to, to, to tell a story in that world and do my version of that and do my interpretation and kind of pay homage to the things that inspired me, I mean, there's, like, I was, you know, even though it was hard work and it stressed me out, like, I loved every second of it because I was doing something that I felt passionate about and, and you really can't ask for more than that. Damn. Now, it makes me think, too, and you kind of touched on it a little bit about almost kind of being like a control freak, and you've made, like, all your music videos. Would you ever 
<laughs> Could you ever imagine somebody else making a, a video for one of your songs? You know, it, it, that, that is, man, you're asking awesome questions, by the way. Like, I've been doing interviews, and, and this is definitely, like, these questions are just, like, on point. Um Thank you. Uh, that's that is probably the best question you could ask because that's the problem. That's the thing that I that's that's you know that's that's a hurdle that I'm going to have to learn how to get over. And that's some that's a question that people that work close with me are worried about or ask about a lot. And it's and it's you know I can't I can't say because I haven't tried it yet. I know that it would be weird for me. You know when I do my next EP that I've already started writing, I'm considering the idea of bringing on a um, second producer and having someone mix and master it for me. Because I've always mixed and mastered all, and engineered all my own albums, but the problem is, is because I'm such a perfectionist, I can spend six months mixing my EP, which is just totally insane. So, right. um, you know, this. So I'm starting to learn to go. Okay, look, maybe I have to, may, not be so much of a control freak and not be so uh, hands on, and learn how to take a step back and try to and try to let other people trust other people enough. And, and be disconnected enough to to let someone else kind of help me take it to the finish line, but I don't know how that's going to go because I still haven't actually done that yet. I've always kind of been a one man <laughs> show, you know. I, I do all, I do all of it, and and I like it, and I do like it that way. It's just I know that I can't keep it up. If I want to take on bigger projects and I don't want to kill myself and like have a mental breakdown, I'm gonna need right. and get more done, you know. I'm gonna need to learn how to work with a group of people. But I can say this: whoever I wouldn't have anybody do anything for me unless I felt like they were as good or better than I am and that they know exactly what my vision is. Because I've had people tell me, why don't you get interns? Or why don't you get somebody that you can train, like an apprentice? And I'm like, because the time I would spend trying to teach that apprentice and look over his shoulder and make sure that's exactly the way I would want it to be, I may as well just sit down and do it myself. I'd rather, if I'm right. going to have somebody do it for me, I'd rather hire somebody that I'm like, you're amazing. I love your work. You do things that I would never even think of. You go do this section. You go do the visual effects. I trust you. You know, like, so, the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a learning process, but um, I, I hope I can get there. Uh, I, I, without a doubt, you're going to get there. I know that. <laughs> I just need the right people. I'm just waiting for the team. Now, how about, like, um, I, I saw, too, you, uh, the uh, the video for Surrender uh, won a bunch of awards at a uh, film and fashion award show. Um so, like, when something like that happens, I mean, now you're winning awards for your work. You know, bells got to start going off in people's minds. Like, this dude's got some freaking talent here. Like, does, does your phone start ringing or you start getting emails from people like, hey, I want you to, like, uh, you're interested in making a music video for this person or, you know, a film here or yeah. something like that? Or Yeah, ever since, I mean, ever since I think I, you know, honestly, after Stars, um, I people started taking notice. And that was great. And then I did a fashion film um, right after I released my Stars music video. I did a fashion, a, a short sci-fi fashion film for IRK Magazine. And that, um, got, that got, I think, three nominations. Um, it didn't win anything, but it got uh, three nominations. I think it was Best Visual Effects, Best Creative Concept, and Best uh, Cinematography, I want to uh, say. So I was, um, I was totally like, you know, just, just having those nominations was amazing, but that helped put me on the map. So like that, that, um, right. that project was when I first started getting people going, Hey, let's work together on this or let's do that. It's just the projects that were coming my way. Either they didn't interest me or um, they were, they, you know, the things didn't line up and, you know, it, nothing much came of that since doing surrender though. Um, and then winning the award for best visual effects, which was one of the, I mean, of all the things that I, I had got five nominations. I got best music, best visual effects, best cinematography, best art direction, and best creative concept. And of all the awards, the one that I was like, I really want to win best visual effects. I've spent so much time on these visual effects. As much as best music would be great, the one that I really want is best visual effects. So when I won that, it was just the best feeling in the world to go up there and, and hold that award and know that, like, out of, you know, all the thousands and thousands of, video submissions and everything that I, that I, all that work that I did got me that award. So that was, that was great. Now how about the and, um, on the big screen? Oh God, that was awesome. Yeah. Getting to see it with a crowd and, and hear the reaction and experience the reaction of the people, you know, and that was, and I had literally just made the deadline for that. So I was just fresh pulling myself out of like a little 
you know, a little hole I had dug myself where I just sat there in the dark, you know, editing nonstop in front on, you know, on my laptop. Um, and so that was like my first experience with like getting to see a reaction from people and see how they actually like all this work. Cause when you're, you know, I, I mean, as an artist yourself, I'm sure you can relate when you're working on something, one minute I'll be thinking, Oh man, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. The next minute I'm like, this is terrible. This is crap. People are going to laugh at me. This is awful. Like, and so like, you're, you know, I was just so bipolar about how I felt about it that when I put, when, when it played on the big screen and everyone was, you know, applauding and, and really liked it, it was like this, I definitely finally kind of got that confirmation that like, okay, all right, this is, this is, you know, I didn't, I didn't mess this up. Like, this is, this is a good, this is good. And then when I got the award, I was just like, you know, it made it feel like it was all worth it. That's awesome. That is so freaking awesome. So, so like, what happens then if it comes down to where you got to make a choice? You know what I mean? Like, uh, you, you say you get big offers for like major movies or something like that, and there's now no mm-hmm. time for music. It, it, do you decide like, all right, well the music has been great, but I got to go this direction now? I mean, I'm always going to have music be a part of what I do um, if I can help it. I mean, I'm very picky about projects. I get amazing offers sometimes. <laughs> like, I mean, I've gotten some really great offers that I've flat out turned down because. You know, if I did, if if money was my concern, I'd be working as a creative director for some digital agency right now. You know, I mean, I'm I'm sure I would make a lot more money and have a much cushier lifestyle financially if I did that. But I I've always gone after the things that are I can get passionate about and that are uh, rewarding to me creatively and just just all around fulfilling. So, whatever project that I did. It would have to I, – I'm sure that I would be involved, you know, on, at some capacity musically because when I think of a, a project, I don't just think in terms of, like, you know, because of the fact that I am a musician and a director and, and, a, and a visual artist, um, when I'm imagining, like, a scene, I'm imagining the music and I'm imagining what the camera's going to do and I'm imagining, like, you know, all the other stuff. So it would be weird for me to not be able to do the music on a project. As, as far as being a musician goes um, – I don't, I mean, I'm used to taking long breaks in between EPs. So if I had to take a two year break between, you know, from music to go work on a film and then turn around and put out maybe a new, at least a new single or a new EP, that wouldn't feel like a horrible loss. I really do feel like I could do both. But I mean, that being said, how long am I going to be able to do music that people care about? You know, like I'm not going to be. 60 or 70 years old making music that everybody's bumping in the club and that everyone's like, yo, this song is fire, son. Like that, that is not going to happen. So clearly like the long game is going to be being a movie director. Cause I feel like you can still be an amazing director that's totally relevant and, and making great work. Well, you know, I mean, until the day you drop dead, but as a musician, you do kind of have a expiration date. Cause at some point, no matter, no matter how much you try, I think at some point you just lose touch with, like what, what's relevant? Like because you you know you right. they say you kind of, you know your taste gets stuck. And I try very hard as a musician because I, I think we all do. You know, I mean, I read a study that says the music you like when you were 15 becomes the music that you think is the greatest. You know, throughout your entire life. And I'm like, man, I don't want to be like that. Like I don't want to I don't want to think like man, Deftones and Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson. That was the best music. And every music that's not that is just trash. Like I don't. Like I can appreciate brand new artists right now, and I don't. I hope that that never changes, but I'm sure it will. I'm sure there's going to come a day when I'm listening to the radio and I go, "This is garbage." And like, what is this stuff? All this crap these kids listen to, and that's the day I shouldn't be making music anymore. In my opinion, that's the day that I just focus on making movies. Wow, that's awesome. You know, because I almost kind of feel that way about music. You know what? I shouldn't say that because. I I do listen to so many newer bands and, and artists and and like I I like your stuff but like some of it well most of it is like pop music that's coming out now like I I just don't get it and I'm just like what is going on here like <laughs> and I've yeah, always been a like, big pop music fan but yeah to be fair, some of though, it's just did like you get pop music in the 90s did you get pop music in the 80s like yeah like oh, yeah. either I think pop See, I didn't get pop. I hated pop music in the '90s just as much as I hate pop music in the, you know, in 2018. Like, to me, like Backstreet Boys was just as like hard for me to wrap my head around as Taylor Swift is now. Like, I'm just like, 
you know, that section of music will, will always baffle me, you know, like I'll always be like, that's, that's for, that's for people with horse girl energy. That's not for me. Like I'm not about that life. <laughs> uh, see, and, and I don't like a, a lot of that's, I, I mean, I don't purposely listen to it, but if it comes on, I don't mind it. I, I'll enjoy it, but there's just some, like some of the, I don't, I don't even know who I'll pay in, but there's just some stuff like if I'm flipping or the radio and I'm just like, what is going on? Like, what is this? And and even I'll say this one, Kanye West. Like, I don't get it. Like, I I don't know. <laughs> People. No, there's more of a gimmick around Kanye. I mean, I you know, look, I I can appreciate his music, and I do think that there are things that he's done um, that are I will say, like you know, in his own right, you know, you could could be considered genius. As a whole, though, kind of living. I think I think that right now, uh, I think he's kind of like kind of coasting off of the brilliance of when he first came out. Cause when he first came out, he really did like, he came out swinging and he showed he had a lot of talent, but like, and I'm not saying he's not a talented dude, but I just feel like it's become more about, it's become more about his character than it is about the music or the art. And, and I think that it's, you know, wearing thin for most people. Hey, when I saw the clip of him on Saturday Night Live a few weeks ago wearing like a, a Mountain Dew soda outfit thing, I, I was just like, game over. Like, he's really flipped his lid now. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can only imagine what Kanye's world must be like. It, I mean, that's just a strange, strange world. Uh, he doesn't live in our on our planet, and he's not surrounded by, you know, the things that we you – know, he's just not in our world. He's in, like, super star, star fantasy land. So, I mean, yeah. you know, when, that's a strange place to be. So God only knows where, you know, where he's at mentally and emotionally. And I don't think the that's fact true. that he – he has mental he clearly he's he admitted he has mental problems i don't think that that helps either uh, so all right so uh lust and vulgarity is the new ep uh the new single yep. video is called surrender people really really yep. need to see it. not only see this but here it's a great tune as well um thank you where's the best place to go to send everybody to uh find out more about you to get the music the videos yeah, well, all my social media is at Joey Danger. Um, I'm probably most active on Instagram, but um, all my social media is at Joey Danger. Um, my SoundCloud is Joey Dash Danger, but everything else is uh, Joey Danger. Um, Joey Danger Music, I should say, at Joey Danger Music, and my website is JoeyDanger.com. And I'm my my album's available on all streaming platforms: um, uh, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, you name it. It's it's out there. So, and the album is Less Than Vulgarity, and I hope you guys like it. Awesome. I do. I'm a fan. You got me. Man, I appreciate it. I'm really glad you liked it. Yeah, man. Dude, this, this was great talking to you. Uh, again, can't praise you enough on the, on the talent you have. And uh, I'm looking forward to Thank seeing you. more. Hopefully it doesn't take 16 months for the next video, though. No, hopefully not. But but if it does, I, I you know, um, I would make sure – I'll make sure it's worth it. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, thanks, man. And, uh, again, congrats on everything. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Take care.